All right, I want us to go back to where we began in this series, to John chapter 15 tonight. John chapter number 15, and we're going to look at the first five verses as we begin our, our thoughts here this evening. John chapter 15, you got your Bible open. Uh, you just follow along as I read tonight. Very familiar verses. We read them a number of times as we uh, preached down through them and then moved away with the same thought in mind. Looking at God's plan for our lives, His ultimate plan for every one of our lives. And of course that has to do with our being conformed to the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse 1 of John 15, I am the true vine. I underline that word true. I mean, he's the genuine vine. There are, a lot, there, there are a lot of false vines. There's a lot of false religion in our world. But there ain't but one true vine. That's the Lord Jesus. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That's a great verse of scripture. Oh my, if you want your life clean, you're going to have to spend time in the word of God. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Father, thank you for the reading of the word of God. Thank you for the wonderful truth that's here. Thank you, Lord, for the, the convicting truth that's here. Uh, Lord, and, and uh, Lord, help us as we, as we look at this, not, not to just see black letters on white paper, but to understand that this is the very Word of God, and it's truth for our hearts. It, it is nourishment for our souls in these days of famine in this world. And if we're to be what we ought to be as children of God, and if we're ever, ever to be conformed to the image of Christ, it's going to come about because we abide in you and allow you to control our hearts and our lives. Bless the needs in this room tonight. Speak to those needs and encourage the saints of God. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. I told you at least one time, maybe more than one time over the last number of years, one of the highlights of my ministry came a number of years ago now before Dr. Lee Robertson went home to be with the Lord. After Robertson, Dr. Robertson retired and especially in the, in the latter years of his life when he was no longer able to do very much traveling at all. He continued to maintain the custom of coming to his office at Highland Park Baptist Church every day at lunchtime. Ms. Joe Shadowins, who uh, for, for many, many years was Dr. Robertson's secretary, would line up pastors in the area to go to Dr. Robertson's house, pick him up, carry him to lunch at Wally's Restaurant out, out to, uh, next to I-75 there on Ringgold Road, uh, and uh, then bring him to the church office after lunchtime. I don't know how many times, a number of times, at least a half dozen times, and probably more than that, but Tom McGuirt and myself had the privilege of uh, being those uh, Uber drivers, or whatever you want to call it, to go pick up Dr. Robertson and carry him to lunch. And it was a blessing, always a blessing. You didn't have to worry about what Dr. Robertson was going to eat because they knew at Wally's Restaurant what he was going to eat. They never wrote, his, never wrote down what he wanted to eat. They just bring it to the table. He always ate flounder and cottage cheese and, 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 and peaches. That was it every day at lunchtime. That was his diet. Well, we had an opportunity during those times. Dr. Robertson's uh, short-term memory was sort of like mine and yours. It was, it was getting kind of rough in those last days. But his, his long-term memory was very good. And he was, he was so happy to answer questions. Any question you would ask. We, we asked him about uh, who the greatest revivalist was. I was expecting him to say Billy Graham or Hyman Alpha or something like that. I didn't even know the guy he, whose name he called. It was some country preacher from up in Tennessee. The greatest revivalist I've ever known, he said. Greatest revival I've ever been in. He came to our church and preached. Well, 
I asked him one day as we sat at lunch, we'd finished eating, and because uh, we'd asked him several things, and I, I asked him a question. I said, Dr. Robertson, this would have probably been in the early 90s. So I, I had been here six, eight years, something like that, maybe nine years. And I, and I asked him, I said, Dr. Robertson, what do you believe to be the key to longevity in the pastorate and the key to living a successful Christian life? And I was amazed without, without, without a blink in his eye, without a moment's hesitation. He said, die to self and die to criticism and compliments and seek to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That was it. Just one, two, three, like that. Die to self, die to criticism, die to compliments and seek to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I, I wouldn't stand here and tell you tonight that I have been successful 100% in applying either of those truths in my lives. But I, what I will tell you tonight is that when I've labored at applying those truths, I have found my Christian life to be much better. Die to self. Get over what you want and what you want to see and what you think ought to happen. Die to criticism. Quit worrying about ever, ever black crow sitting on a on a power line somewhere, calling at you, criticizing what you're doing, and also die to compliments. You, you, if you aren't careful, compliments will kill you. And then seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The question I, I want us to consider tonight is around what I've told you. How can I manifest the life of Christ? I want us to talk or think for a little while tonight about the manifested Christian life. We've been talking about God's will for our lives, God's plan for our lives, that we be conformed to the image of Christ. That simply would say that we ought to be displaying the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. Well, how can I do that? How can I, how can I manifest the life of Christ in this world? How can I do that without the interference of the flesh? How can I live in such a way that the, the life of Christ will be manifested through me? Well, let me, give you, let me give you four quick things tonight that we need to understand that if, if, if we're going to live out the life of Christ in this world, four things that uh, just jot them down in your Bible there or on a piece of paper somewhere and then, and then go home and think about it. I, I won't be able to share everything that needs to be shared tonight and I certainly won't be able to touch on, on everything that the Holy Spirit wants to touch on in your life. First of all, if, if you're going to manifest the life of Christ, if it's going to happen in your life, you need to understand that the life of Christ is a relationship to enjoy. The, the Christian life is to be enjoyed, not endured. <laughs> Hello? I, I, I see a lot of people who claim to be Christians that need to be notified of that news. This thing of serving God is not something that we endure. It's something that we ought to enjoy. John tells us here, Jesus, he's recording the words of Jesus here. He, he, he gives us a couple of things here uh, about the Christian life that, that we need to remember. First of all the, is the fact that Christ is the vine. I know we've already touched on that, but... Repetition is one of the best teachers in the world, and, and you need to have that stamped in your heart tonight. Christ is the vine. He said, I am the true vine, the, the genuine vine. Not only is Christ the vine, but verses 4 and 5 tell us that we are the branches. He's the root, but we're the fruit. And, and the key to us bearing the right kind of fruit is abiding in him. What he's saying here is that as his followers, you, are, you and I are extensions of himself. Amen. Notice the words, abide in me and I and you. You see, as a Christian, you, you cannot live out the life of Christ unless you abide in him. How many times you've heard this said, how many times have you heard people say, well, you know, preacher, I... I'd get saved if I thought I could live the Christian life. Well, let, let, I don't want to depress you tonight, but let, let, let me let you in on something tonight. You are never going to be able to live the Christian life in your strength. That ain't never going to happen. 
But the glorious truth is, <laughs> if you'll surrender to Christ and you'll abide in Him, He'll become the strength in your life. He'll become the power that enables you to live the Christian life. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul gave testimony in his own life. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, Paul was saying the life I'm living right now is not my own life. I, I stopped living my own life when, when I said yes to Jesus. I'm not living my own life right now. It is Christ being lived out through me. We've got to recognize that Christ is the vine and we are the branches and his desire is to live through us. In this world, he wants you and I to be living representatives of who he is to a lost and dying world. In 1 John 2 and verse 27, John said, But the, uh, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. Now you know, you, know, you understand what that word anointing means. It means, it means God has put, put something special on you. God wants to anoint my life and your life, but, but, but this only comes through the relationship that we have with His Son, Jesus Christ. It, it, it cannot happen uh, apart from that. The word abide means to remain with Christ. It, it involves spending time with Him. Communing with him, developing a relationship with him, meditating on his word. The, the, the pace of life and the hour that we live is so fast that if we don't guard our time as Christians, then we'll forget about fellowship and, and, and communing with him. That, that's one of the reasons that I've said over and over again, uh, the best time of the day to have your devotional time is, is the morning time because I promise you an hour uh, or an hour and a half after you wake up, the clock's going to be running so fast. You're never going to get back to him. You're going to be taking off down the road. Your grandkids are going to be calling. Your kids are going to be calling. The job is going to be calling. Somebody is going to want something to take you away from spending the time you ought to be spending with the Lord. Instead of abiding in a, in a joyful relationship with Christ, we aren't careful, we'll live for selfish pleasures. We'll involve ourselves in, in doing something maybe that's not even wrong. I'm not talking about something sinful other than the fact that anything that takes us away from, from time being spent with Christ, then that is a sinful thing no matter what it is. The fact is, the busier we are, the more we need God and the more strength we need from Him. So first of all, if we're going to manifest the life of Christ, we need to understand that, that the life of Christ is a relationship to enjoy. It's, it, it's not a relationship to endure, but a relationship to enjoy. Secondly, we've got to understand that the life of Christ involves obedience from the heart. Once we understand that living the Christian life is primarily abiding in a relationship with Christ, then we've got to understand that this relationship involves obedience from the heart. Let me talk to you about two things as far as obedience is concerned in our relationship with Christ. First of all, obedience is critical. Every relationship we have in this world generates or produces its own set of rules consistent to the one that we're relating to. Our job, the job we work at. If you, they may not have a whole list of rules and things that are there, but if you're going to relate to that job as you ought to, then there are certain things that you're going to have to do. I mean, there's a time you've got to be there, and there's a time you've got to stay there, there are certain things you've got to do while you're there, and if you don't do those things, you're going to really lose that relationship. Now, I know that in this world, a lot of times Christians that, uh, that attend old-fashioned, Bible-believing, Baptist churches 
are often criticized by the world. The world will say, well, the, the problem with fundamental Christianity is that it's so legalistic. It's all about rules. Well, well let me just say, hold on here a minute. Let, let's just stop for a minute. Just stop right there for a minute and think about what you're saying. The Christian life is not about a set of rules. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. My Christian life is not about the Ten Commandments. My Christian life is about my relationship with Jesus Christ. The, the truth is every relationship we have is going to have its own set of rules that guide that relationship. Good example. Your marriage. Whether in our marriage we make a set of rules and print a set of rules or not, I can tell you those rules exist. They're going to be there. If you're going to have a meaningful marriage, it's going to be there. I, I, I hear the term that, that's used sometimes in, in this liberal and woke hour that we're living in. People say, well, well, you know, things have changed. We've got an open marriage. And what they mean by that is the husband goes his way and the wife goes her way. And they have open and intimate relationships outside their marriage relationship without even hiding it from their marriage partner. They, 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 they go and, and they do their own thing without consulting or, or having any concern for their marriage partner. And you know what they call this? They call this freedom. But it ain't freedom, it's grounds for divorce. All you got to do is look at Hollywood. All, listen, you, you don't have to be a brainchild to see all that. Amen. There is no way that a meaningful marriage is not going to have some rules that's a part of that marriage. Some principles to guide that marriage. Every valuable relationship is governed by guidelines and rules. All of them. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We, we, can, we can have a relationship with him, but it means nothing if we don't obey him. You hear these people say, oh, I know the Lord, I love the Lord, but they don't go to church, they don't live according to the word of God. Listen, they don't have a relationship. They may have, they, they may have a religion, but they don't have a relationship. A true relationship with Christ is going to produce obedience from the heart. Notice secondly, not only is obedience critical, in our relationship with Christ, but it's commanded. In John 15 and verse 10, Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept the Father's commandments, and abide in his love. That verse tells us that we are to obey our heavenly Father. Let, let, let's just take our Baptist tag and, and, and let's put it aside. Or... or any other denominational name, Methodist or uh, Presbyterian or, or, or whatever, just, just put that world tag aside. If you want to be a good Christian, then you've got to learn to obey God's commands. That's exactly what Jesus did in his life. He voluntarily submitted to the rules and the will of his father. And what we're talking about here is, is not legalistic Christianity, what we're talking about is Bible Christianity. We're talking about the, we're talking about the real thing here, some, something that has depth to it. In James chapter 1 and verse 22, James said, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Notice that word deceiving. In other, in other words, if, you, if, you're, if you're just a hearer of the word and you don't do the word, then you're doing nothing but deceiving yourself. James 4, uh, John 14, verse 23, Jesus said, If a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. I'm so very much afraid that so much of this so-called Christianity in America in the 21st century 
has the idea that you can have a relationship with God and live any way you want to live. Bring anything into your life that pleases you or makes you happy. I, I, I've had children of parents who belong to this church in days past who left the church and said to their parents, what that preacher preaches is not relative to the hour we live in. Nobody can live up to that standard. Well, if nobody can live up to this standard, then we're all going to hell. There ain't a hope for one of us. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. If God put it in his word, and if he, if he tells me, if, if you abide in me, then you can live this way, then that's truth. That's reality for my life. I've watched some of that crowd. I, see, I've been here long enough at almost 39 years now, and I've watched that crowd as they've come along. And boy, I want to tell you, some of them have made a big, awful mess out of their lives. I mean, it's been a mess. And I wonder tonight if they don't think sometimes about back there. They probably don't even remember what they said. There's nothing more than a cheap substitute for real Christianity. And the devil would love to sell you that in this world. Real Christianity recognizes that God gave his all for us. And because we love him, we're going to live for him. He loved us enough to die for us. And we're going to give our, our all to obey him from a sincere heart. So if we're going to if we're going to manifest the life of Christ, we've got to understand the life of Christ is a relationship to enjoy. Not a relationship to endure, but to enjoy. We've got to realize that it involves obedience from the heart. Number three, we've got to understand that the life of Christ is guided by the Holy Spirit. Well, I preached on that Sunday morning and the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We must, we, we, listen, there's no other way to live the Christian life unless we're being guided by the Holy Spirit. Where does he get the details that he uses to guide us? I know you, you, you got some crazy messed up people in this world who have all kind of crazy ideas about the Holy Spirit. And, I, and I'm telling you, I, I, I look at some and hear some of the junk that goes on today in, in the name of, of God, in the name of Christ, and, and they're talking about the Holy Spirit. And I think, it, it, I think I'd just quit going anywhere if that's what I had to. Listen, I, got, I was around some of that stuff when I was young. I saw some of that weird and strange stuff going on. I've seen people fall out on the floor and then cover them up with a sheet. I've seen folks jerk and jump and all that kind of... Listen, that scared me to death. That, that is so far from reality. I, I, you say, preacher, I wouldn't say that. I'd be afraid to say that. Well, you don't have to say it because I'm going to say it. And what I'm saying is based on the Word. You won't find anywhere in the Word of God that the Spirit of God ever made anybody act stupid and foolish like that. Amen. Never. It's not there. Where does the Holy Spirit get the details that he uses to guide us? Well, it's just one place, and that's the Word of God. He reveals his power through the truth of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Paul said, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. We talked about that some Sunday morning in the message on the Holy Spirit, how he guides and how he directs Jesus talks about that on over in John chapter 16. I'll not take time to turn there. Just read what he said in, in chapter 14, chapter 16 about the Holy Spirit. And you'll see his ministry at work. We live in a world today that is, that is full of distractions to hinder our spiritual growth. And if God is going to communicate with us, then we've got to commit ourselves to making time for him to speak. We, we, can't, we can't go on in our lives in a marathon race and have God speak to us. As a believer, you've you, you, you got to be a person who 
comes to the word. You, you got to come to God didn't go reach out yonder and get scripture and bring over here and take the cap off your head and put it in. You're going to have to come to the word. It's as you come and read the word yourself that the spirit of God is going to speak to you. Look at John 14 and verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, in case you don't know who I'm talking about, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Thank God for preachers. Thank God for teachers, for evangelists. But the great illuminator in the spiritual life is the Holy Spirit. God uses preachers and teachers, evangelists and missionaries, but we're nothing more than mouthpieces. We, 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 don't, we don't have, listen, I don't have the power to take from my lips and put anything in your heart. All I can do is open the word and share it with you, but it is God the Holy Spirit who comes down and takes that precious word and plants it in our soul. We do well to listen to him to know him, to cultivate a relationship with him as we talked about Sunday morning and then to listen to his still small voice in our life. Where does he get his details from? From the word of God. Well, how's he going to direct us? He's certainly not going to direct you in some of the crazy ways you hear people talking about today. I hear some of the craziest things being said and attributed to the Holy Spirit that he's not within a million miles of i tell you what the Holy Spirit will do. He will guide and lead you always away from sin. Always. Galatians 5, 16 through 18, Paul said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would, but if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. We're not bound by the law. We're guided by the Spirit, which will lead us into the truth and show us the path of righteousness. Have you ever, have you ever stopped to think that you and I in this time that we live are so much better off with the Holy Spirit living in us than the nation of Israel was when, when Moses came down off that mountain with those Ten Commandments written in stone. Because they, 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 they could not keep those Ten Commandments. They, they couldn't live according to those Ten Commandments. We say how foolish that was. No, it wasn't foolish. God was just making them aware. You, you're never going to be able to attain the righteousness that I expect for you to attain in yourself. You can't. But the glorious truth today is a child of God. The Spirit of God lives within me, within you if you're saved. And he gives us the power, the ability, the strength to be able to live according to the will of God. Yes. It's a fact that the Holy Spirit was given to comfort us. But he's also given to guide us. And let me caution you about something tonight. You hear folks say, well... I'm just going to let my conscience be my guide. Well, you're living on dangerous ground, friend, because I, I want to tell you, I don't know of anything more dangerous in your life than letting your conscience be your guide. It's the Holy Spirit that, that guides us and convicts our conscience from within. It's just such a dangerous thing in our lives to ignore the leading of the Holy Spirit within us. His leading is God's way reminding us to follow Him. What a... What a wonderful companion. I said it Sunday morning. What a wonderful, wonderful companion the Holy Spirit is in the life of the child of God. If you want to manifest the Christian life in this world, understand that the life of Christ is guided by the Holy Spirit. And then one final thought. If we're going to manifest the life of Christ in this world today, we've got to understand that the life of Christ requires endurance by grace. How can I endure as a child of God? Manifesting the life of Christ begins with a relationship. It's a relationship of abiding and walking with Him. 
That personal walk is going to produce a willing heart of obedience as the Holy Spirit guides us day by day. And then finally, if we're to manifest the life of Christ in this world, we've got to endure by His grace. Let me mention a couple of things here and I'm done. First of all, the promise of His grace to endure. When I was a boy growing up, the old timers in church used to call it the perseverance of the saints. I can remember hearing the preacher preach on the perseverance of the saint. And I've heard people say, well, bless God, if you really got it, it'll endure to the end. The perseverance of the saints. Paul had a couple of words he used for it. In Romans 2 and verse 7, he called it patient continuance. Read that verse. Patient continuance. This is a frustrating world we're living in, isn't it? I, I'm telling you, it, it's frustrating everywhere you go, but it's frustrating in the church. I, I, sometimes I get so frustrated I can pull my hair out. What little's left. That's probably the reason it's getting as thin as it's getting today. But you can't demonstrate the life of Christ living on Frustration Avenue. Trials are going to come in our lives. All of God's children, listen, you're not going to escape this world without trials. If, you're, if, if things are peaceful and quiet right now, you ought to get on your face and thank God before you leave this building tonight because you may not get home before the phone rings. Endurance is not an easy thing. But what you and I can do is determine to be faithful to God until we take our last breath here on earth. You say, preacher, how can we do that? I'll tell you how. By God's grace. Well, where's that going to come? Well, He promised us that grace. He promised us grace for every trial, every situation that comes in our lives. Remember how Paul talked about it? Finishing his course, running his race, pressing toward the mark. That's what the Christian life's all about. Finishing this course, running this race, pressing, and sometimes they're just miles and miles of that pressing toward the mark. All through the Word of God, we are commanded to pursue the life of Christ with patience and with endurance. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Well, how can I receive that grace? What is the prerequisite for me receiving that grace that you're talking about? In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, the Bible says, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. God cannot, God will not give his grace to a heart that's filled with pride. I don't know an awful lot. I don't have an awful lot of wisdom about a lot of things. But I can tell you I have lived long enough in this world to know that God will not give his grace to a heart that's full of pride, full of itself. That heart's got to first of all be emptied of pride. How does the Lord empty us of pride? You're not going to like this. In fact, Vince, you might as well put your hands over your ears right now just so you won't hear this because you're not going to like this. I'll tell you how God empties me of pride and how he empties you of pride. Through the trials and the tribulations of this world. Because until you reach a point in your life where you realize it is not your ability and it's not your strength, I can tell you you're not in a place to receive that grace in your life. Psalm 51 and verse 17 reminds us that God is drawn to a repentant and submissive spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. What is the manifesting of the life of Christ in this world? It's not following some ethical ideal set down in a set of rules and regulations. That's not manifesting the life of Christ. All you're going to wind up with in, in the midst of that is frustration in your life. I, I believe there's a way for us to live, a way that we ought to live. 
But it, 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 we, we don't just reach over and get us a set of rules and lay down in front of us and say, now I'm going to manifest the life of Christ. Point number one, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to, I can tell you what's going to happen. You're going to wind up frustrated in life. It is a manifestation of God's spirit in the life of a believer. That's when the life of Christ is going to be manifested in me and in you. When the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives. We can enjoy a personal relationship with God himself. I enjoy, do you enjoy hearing other people talk about how they enjoyed their relationship with the Lord in prayer? Boy, I do. I, it just thrills my heart. I, it encourages me. But I want to tell you something that I enjoy much more than hearing other people talk about how the Lord blessed them in their prayer time is me having that experience. And God desires for that to happen. That, 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 there are no big, big U's and little U's in this thing of serving God. God, listen, your circle of life is totally different than mine. But where you are in your life, God wants to manifest himself through you. Because there, there are things and there are people and situations there that I could never touch. But you can if Christ is being manifested in you. And when we experience that relationship with him, what we're going to do as a result of that is obey him from a heart of love through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a fact that the Christian life is going to contain some struggles. They're going to be there. But God provides His grace for those who will humbly ask for it. And we can trust Him to give us the strength every day that we live so that we can finish our course with joy. We can join the Apostle Paul <laughs> as he said to Timothy, i finished my course. I've run the race. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown. Of we, listen, you say, I could never do that. Oh, yes, you can. Because the same thing God had for Paul, he has for you and he has for me. If we'll simply allow him to work in our lives and through our lives. Manifesting the Christian life. God help us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I, I want to thank you for letting me stand here tonight. Thank you for speaking to my heart through what I've studied and whether anybody else in this room was helped tonight. I was helped. And so, Father, I pray you'd touch in a special way the needs here tonight. And wherever a need's been spoken to, I, I pray that one would say yes to you. Father, I pray that if there's somebody struggling tonight, Help them to see the end of that struggle. Rest in the hands of the Spirit of God as He gives strength and power to endure and to be the Christian that they ought to be. Help us now in these moments to make right decisions for you. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me just a minute while Miss Janet plays?